Final. 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 Ever since I was a little kid, I have loved radio. I remember getting one of those FM car transmitters that allowed you to play your music over a radio station in the car, and that was the coolest thing to me. I joined a student radio club at university where I learned radio etiquette and how to put together a proper show, even though it is only an internet stream for the time being. But lately I have been taking to the airwaves and looking into the deeper, darker side of radio, specifically one station that I found to be intriguing and troubling, a station that consistently beams its transmissions toward the United States, a station seemingly meant for only those who can decode it. It has been given the name HMO1. Now, if you don't know much about the mechanics of radio, that's fine. I'm going to give a crash course on the radio spectrum and the mechanics of radio as told by someone who isn't an expert themselves. Now, the radio spectrum is as follows. This diagram looks like a lot, but really it's not that hard to understand. From 3 kilohertz to 30 kilohertz is the very low frequency band used mainly for submarine traffic and radio communications. From 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz is the long wave band. Radio controlled clocks will actually receive long wave radio signals and synchronize themselves accordingly to adjust their time. From 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz is the medium wave band, most commonly recognized as the AM broadcast band. A popular station here in Ohio is 1.1 megahertz or WTAM 1100. From 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz is the high frequency band or more commonly known as the short wave band. This is the band that we are going to be focusing on. And just for reference, the 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz is the very high frequency band, more commonly known as the FM broadcast band. A popular station here in Ohio is 96.5 MHz, or KISS FM. So from this diagram, you can see that the shortwave band is sandwiched between the AM and FM broadcast bands. Now, let's talk about propagation. Propagation is a big word that just refers to how a radio wave travels. So, in the AM broadcast band, the radio waves mainly travel along the ground. This allows them to follow the curvature of the Earth, and depending on the transmitter's power, allows them to travel for a few hundred miles in good broadcast conditions. I remember being able to hear WTAM 1100 in Chicago on a summer night when conditions were good. However, the FM band does not behave this way. If you've ever gone on a road trip while listening to an FM station, you know that you get about 60 miles worth of coverage before the station drops out completely. This is because the waves travel directly in a line of sight transmission. This is why FM broadcast towers are hundreds of feet tall. The taller the tower, the farther the beam can travel before it gets obstructed by the curvature of the Earth. And this is the really cool part about shortwave. It doesn't travel along the ground like AM, and it doesn't travel line of sight like FM. Instead, the radio beams bounce off the ionosphere and the surface of the Earth repeatedly, allowing the signal to travel around the entire globe in the right conditions. On good nights, it's possible to receive transmissions from Asia and Europe in North America. The shortwave radio spectrum isn't used as widely as it once was thanks to the internet, but you can still receive plenty of international programming if you know their schedules. There are, of course, amateur radio bands where licensed operators can legally communicate with each other through voice, Morse code, or other digital modes. And then there are odd transmissions. Some of these are radio beacons, high power transmitters that only send out a repeated sound that allow you to gauge how good broadcasting conditions are at any given time. But be looking in the right place at the right time, and you might find a station that only broadcasts seemingly random strings of numbers in a computerized voice. These are the number stations, and they are used for espionage, government agencies communicating with their agents in the field. The closest thing we have to proof that these stations are the work of spy networks comes from Jack Barsky, an ex-KGB spy now living in Pennsylvania. He explains that every night he would receive a radiogram from Russia giving him useful information on what to do next. Every Thursday night at 9.15, Barsky would tune in to a shortwave radio at his apartment in Queens and listen for a transmission he believed came from Cuba. All the messages were 
encrypted that they became digits. And the digits would be sent over as uh, in groups of five. And sometimes that took a good hour to just write it all down and then another three hours to decipher. In the 1990s, Akeen Fernandez began recording these number stations and compiled them into an album known as the Conant Project. Most of the stations in the project are now off air having served their purpose in the Cold War, but today there are still new stations popping up and the internet has made finding them extremely easy. Priam.org is a website dedicated to finding the schedules of certain stations and posting them for the public, as well as providing links to internet radios where you can listen to them in real time. And this is where I discovered the station HM01. Now let's talk about the setup of a standard number station. Seconds before the broadcast, you will hear only static. Then, all of the sudden, you will hear what is known as the call sign of the station its identifier. Usually for most number stations, it's a three number group that is repeated many times before the message. Then after a few seconds, it broadcasts the message identifier. This is usually also three numbers. Then the station will tell you how many numbers are in each group. In this case, it's five. 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 Then the actual message starts. Then the station will eventually sign off. This is the case for most number stations nowadays. Some of them broadcast in Morse code or other digitally encrypted modes, but HM01 combines both into an interesting hybrid alternative. First, the station broadcasts starting at the 57th minute of certain daytime hours, transmitting groups of five numbers in Spanish. According to a radio operator in Brazil, call sign PY4ZBZ, the transmission is a repeated sequence of eight groups of six five-digit numbers. Here's what that looks like on screen. And then after several minutes, things get weird. A piercing digital tone can be heard for several seconds. Then one more five digit number and one more digital tone. Uno, cinco, dos, uno, tres. This lasts for over half an hour and is repeated at the 57th minute of the following hour. What the f am I listening to? Well, we all know the numbers mean something. They are all different, but 
they repeat in pattern, so it's safe to say they designate what the message is for, who it's from, or what it's about. Now, the digital tones are actually data, and if you're wondering if it can be decoded, the answer is yes. Sort of. The data is encoded in a program called DigTRX, and it converts text and images into tones that can be sent over the airwaves and decoded back into the original files. So let's try and run it with HM01 and see what we get. Even the decoded messages are still encrypted text files. When exploring it with a hex editor, we can see that there is indeed a pattern, but there's no possible way to ever figure out what these messages mean. So is all hope lost? These messages all use one-time pads, one of the most efficient and foolproof ways to encode and decode a message. You start with a block of randomized text, like this one here, brought to us by the wonderful people at Learning Self-Reliance. Definitely go check them out. Then you have your message, for an example. Let's just use the name Jimmy Smith. And finally, you have your cipher chart, which is just a grid of A to Z and 0 to 9 on the X and Y axis. Now we're going to set this up like an addition problem. Yay, math. Find the first letter of your message on the Y axis, then find the first letter of the one-time pad on the X axis. That point where they intersect is your encrypted letter or character. There are numbers I wrote the script wrong. Do this with each letter and your message is encrypted and ready to send over shortwave to spies overseas. To decrypt your message, find the encrypted letter on the Y axis and your one-time pad letter on the X axis. The intersecting letter is your decrypted character, in this case, J. So are these one-time pads actually used? Well, according to the Washington Post, in 1988, three were found in a bar of hollowed-out soap when a Czech spy, posing as an art dealer in London, was caught by authorities as he sat in his apartment and transcribed a message sent via shortwave. This is very real, and considering this Cuban station is beamed directly at the United States is even more concerning. But we shouldn't be too concerned because a lot of these stations started popping up after World War II, so they aren't anything new. They've just been going on without us really realizing it. Espionage is going to happen even when countries are at peace with one another. You just have to hope that the messages aren't giving instructions to partake in any devastating activities. I hope this video inspired you to at least check out the dying medium that shortwave radio is. At some point, communication via the internet will go down, whether it be from natural disaster or cyber attack, and surely it will be restored at some point. But shortwave radio is something that is so simple and so easy to use that it will be the saving method of communication whenever disaster strikes. I have included links in the description where you can poke around the shortwave spectrum online or buy a portable radio yourself. Also, thanks for watching this non-abandoned related video. I wanted to produce more content on stuff that interests me, but don't worry, there's plenty of urbex coming because it's something that I really enjoy and I'm not gonna stop. So thanks for watching guys. Hey guys, I'm currently editing this thing, and uh, something cool happened a couple of days ago. Um, luckily, I realized it uh, so I could put it in this video. Uh, but it was the 2018 field day for the American Radio Relay League, and basically, it's a period of 24 hours where all amateur radio operators who want to participate can get on air, and you just try to contact as many other people as possible. And it's just like this big... Uh, international contest. Uh, I went to my local radio club who was stationed at Whips Ledges. It's, it's the highest point in the county that I live in. 
and they had like five or six different antennas, a couple different radios, and they were camping out 24 hours, and I, I'm not sure how many contacts we got. We didn't get as many as the years prior, um, but I made a few contacts, and it was a lot of fun. So if you guys want to learn about getting your uh, amateur radio license, uh, I included a link in the description. And here's the video and pictures from Field Day 2018. Thanks, guys.